Hey, people, greetings, welcome, uh, class four, where we will talk about <laughs> what, uh, you know, talk more about what makes life worth living. Um, within the orthodox model, um, you may have a question. Um, and of course, we've talked about how the orthodox model doesn't really, you know, it's about the happiness. But um, within the model, if you buy everything at the point where the pleasure you get just equals the price, you're getting everything for the co a cost that just equals the pleasure you get. So there's no extra pleasure. On the margin, where marginal utility equals the price, what you give up to get things just equals what you get from them. So the question then becomes, why bother? Where's your happiness? Um, and the answer is in what economists call inframarginality, um, which is a fancy word uh, um, for a uh, kind of word that you can use with your parents. You'll talk to them. What are you getting out of that fancy class that you're taking that's costing so much money? And you'll tell them, well, I've learned about inframarginality and how this is the source of happiness. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. After talking about cats and dogs and birds, um, more birds or planes, things that make us happy, quizzes that probably don't make us that happy. Um, you know, get the quiz done. Multiple guests. Talk about Taylor Swift's shirts. Um, just in case you talk to people who took this class before, we change the quizzes and the answers every year. We may have the same every semester. We may have the same subject, but they're different. So don't copy. Um, okay. Uh, if you haven't already, get the textbooks. Do it. Don't waste any more time. And talk about the elasticity of demand or the way businesses make profits off of, off of people. Okay, fun stuff. Again, lectures. Okay, foundation of orthodox neoclassical economics. We get pleasure from things, but we get sated. We get tired of them. Diminishing marginal utility. Because of this, we will buy more only at ever decreasing prices. Our individual demand curves are downward sloping. And this gives us the extreme, under the extreme assumption of independence of individual choice, gives us aggregate. Um, now today we're talking about consumer surplus is the extra pleasure you get over and above what you pay for things. This is the net pleasure. You know, if I, give up $5 of pleasure to get something that's worth $5 of pleasure for me. Nothing, what? Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm only getting what I paid. Um, consumer surplus is what I get over and above that. Now the elasticity demand reflects how much consumption will fall if your business raises prices. You may get a job out of here. I remember this is what I was told when I was in your position as uh, first year, first semester economics student. And um, my professor pacing up at the front of the room said how, oh, many of you will have jobs out of college where you will be calculating the elasticity of demand because your business wants to know how many sales are we going to lose if we raise prices? Or in the other direction, how many extra sales will we get if we raise price, if we lower prices? Um, now the elasticity demand reflects both need and how easy it is to replace a product. This is important because usually in intro textbooks, they talk about need. That's actually not the thing. Need is rarely the, the major factor. You know, what matters is can you get a substitute? Um, capitalists will try to turn your consumer surplus into profits by raising prices. We call this milking the consumer surplus. Um, and we may talk about Disneyland. Okay. 
here's corduroy um, and various other puppies. Puppies make us happy. Um, we have only one puppy. Why do we stop at one? Because at one, the marginal utility equals the price. That said, I get pleasure. I get more pleasure than I paid for them. I wouldn't get the second one, but the first one gives me extra pleasure as it happens. And that's consumer surplus. Think about ice cream, um, which is something that I like almost as much as I love poodles. Um, at the end, at the margin, the last scoop I buy, the price equals the marginal utility. I get pleasure equal to what I pay. No extra happiness. I'm just exchanging the form of my happiness. Instead of having $5 in my pocket in happiness, I have an ice cream scoop in, as happiness. Um, surplus only comes from the first four or 4.9, whatever. Um, those are inframarginal, within the margin. Those scoops give me happiness over and above what I pay. At the margin, <laughs> what is my consumer surplus at the margin? Where I pay $5 for $5 of happiness? Zero. No consumer surplus at the margin. Um, but I get a consumer surplus on every one before. The first scoop, $15 of happiness, I only pay $5. $10 of surplus. Um, you buy until marginal utility equals the price. How much you're willing to pay, that's your marginal utility. Okay. No net marginal utility. Marginal utility is diminishing. Therefore, your surplus is getting smaller up until zero. Look at this. $15 of happiness costs $5, $10 of surplus. Next scoop. $11 of happiness, pay $5, $6 of surplus. Total surplus at that point is $16. Third scoop, $8 of happiness, pay $5, $3. So at that point, we're $19 of surplus. Fourth scoop, $6 of happiness, pay $5, $1 of surplus, $19 is uh, twenty dollars of total happiness. My total consumer surplus from this ice cream is twenty dollars. Um, uh, here we go. Um, well, different numbers. You're buying beer here. You getting beer for a dollar twenty-five? Maybe at a, par at a party. Yeah. Anyway, um, first. First uh, beer gives you $15 of happiness, $13.75 of surplus. The surplus is the difference between your marginal utility and the price. The price is the same for all, these, all the cups of beer. Um, but your surplus, it, your marginal surplus, the surplus on additional ones is going down because your marginal utility is going down. Your total surplus is going up until the last one you buy. Why does your surplus then start to go down? Because you're buying beer that gives you less happiness than the price. That seventh beer, you shouldn't have done it. You, know, you, you get only 50 cents of happiness and you're paying $1.25. You should have just stopped. If you go all the way to nine, you're getting no happiness at all. If you go to 10, you're throwing up. Not only unhappy for you, but for your friends. Um, but your cumulative surplus is going down on the additional beers after number six. Got it? Okay. Wine market, same thing. You buy until the last glass is just worth the price. Every one before that is inframarginal and gives you happiness. Joy to the world from inframarginal buying. You get your pleasure within, within the point where marginal utility equals price. Up until then, you get happiness. Don't go further than that. Don't go further than that. 
stop when marginal utility equals happiness. Uh, sorry, equals price. <laughs> okay, surplus falls on additional purchases because of diminishing marginal utility. This is the net surplus on the additional wine. Buy at 10, where your consumer surplus on that next glass is zero. My God, you drank 10 glasses of wine? <sighs> okay. You should be able to answer this. Um, if your margin, if the price of wine is $5, your marginal utility is $10, do you buy it? Yes. If your marginal utility is $5, do you buy it? Yes. Do you, if your marginal utility is $4, do you buy it? No. Total happiness, $10 minus five, five, plus $5 minus five, zero, five dollars of consumer surplus okay figure out how many glasses you'll buy this is this is the quiz figure out how much surplus add up the surpluses okay elasticity of demand relative change in quantity demanded for a change in price now, let's say this is a percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price. Whew, that's a mouthful. You know, I mean, do I have the equation? No, I think I got rid of the equation here because it's like, why scare people off? If, you're, if you don't calculus, you get this. You know, it's the derivative of the demand function divided by, well, a one unit change in price. You know, the derivative of the price um, tells you how responsive demand is to price changes. How much does the demand change when you change prices? You may have something that we call inelastic demand. This guy with his dog kissing his dog. Do you think that he's going to get rid of the dog if the dog becomes more expensive? If the price of dog food goes up, if the dog has some medical condition and needs his eyes wiped all the time, I mean, Corduroy needs his eyes wiped and he gets eye drops every day. Um, three medications every morning, one medication every night. Um, Violet, beloved 16 year old Violet cat gets two medications every morning and two medications every night. Uh, Corduroy is very cooperative. He, I mean, he'll run behind the chair to hide, but Violet, oh, she hates it. And it's really difficult. Um, you know that if you've ever medicated a cat. Um, okay, anyway, do we get rid of them because they're harder to deal with? Do you think he's gonna get rid of his dog? No, no, these are very inelastic demand. People will keep their puppies and their kittens um, at any price. Let's say you are in a relationship with someone, say boyfriend, girlfriend, and that car breaks down and they need you to pick them up all the time. Maybe not all the time, but sometimes. So they've become a little more expensive. Maybe um, they're having problems at home and they're leaning on you a little bit more they're a little moody. I'm not talking about a whole lot, but some. Um, do you get rid of them? Or do you have an inelastic demand? You may have a, you may have a very elastic demand when it comes to friendships. You may say, ah, eh, too much trouble, too demanding, don't want to bother. Um, you know, let's say uh, the price at your favorite, uh, your most convenient gas station. You know, you're on your way to work. There's a gas station that's on your right when you're coming home, which is a convenient time to do it. Um, it's easy to get in and out, um, but that's where you always go. But then they raise their prices, five cents a gallon. Do you stop going to that? Do you stop buying gas because the price is going up five cents? Probably not. Do you stop dating because your uh, relationship has become a little burdensome? Probably not. Do you stop dating that person? Maybe. Do you stop going to that gas station? There's another gas station. 
a little bit out of the way, but not much. It's cheaper, you go there. Um, you don't necessarily stop something because it becomes more, a stop a product line because it becomes more expensive. You may still buy gas, you may still buy medicine, but you may not continue to buy it at the same place. Demand elasticity depends on these two things. Can you do without the service? Can you do without the love of your dogs? No, absolutely not. I cannot live without, without the love of a dog. Can you find another dog who loves you? Well, no, no dog would love me like that, like Corduroy does. But you know, I said that about Beowulf. Um, I said that about Sooty when I first gave this lecture. Sooty died, we got Beowulf. Beowulf died, we got Corduroy. It was sad, we were very sad, but we moved on. If Sitco or Sunoco goes up in price, I go to Cumberland Farms. Cumberland Farm goes up, I go to Pride. You know, I mean, the Cumberland Farms I usually go to is convenient and I have an app, so it's good. But what the hell? I go to Pride, I use my Google app, so it's fine. I don't even notice the price. It's, it's basically always the same. One may be a penny more than the other. Yeah. Actually, uh, my Cumberland Farms app gives me a 10 cent discount, so I do prefer to go there, 10 cents. But that's kind of the most convenient anyway. And the app makes it easy to pay. So high and low demand elasticity, inelastic demand. Doesn't matter what happens to price, price changes, you still buy the same stuff. Housing, you need a place to live. Uh, insulin, you need it to live. Love. You need it, um, but do you have to have that apartment? Mm, it's really pretty convenient. You have to have that uh, that dog. Yeah, kind of. Do you have to have that insulin from that pharmacy? Uh, there are a lot of pharmacies. Um, you love ice cream. You need ice cream, but do you have to get it from um, that place? Or you could get it from a supermarket. You could get it from, you know, Ben and Jerry's. You could, you know, there are a lot of ways to get the ice cream. So you may have very elastic demand, even for things. And it doesn't matter how much you need the thing. What matters is how easy is it to get a substitute. Necessities don't necessarily have inelastic demand. Highly elastic demand. It's easy to stop buying when prices rise because you can get a substitute or you don't need it at all. Find another way to <laughs> yeah, DVDs. It doesn't matter how cheap they get. I'm not going to get a DVD. Yeah. Um, inelastic demand. It's hard to stop buying even when prices rise unless you can get a substitute. Penicillin. You need penicillin, but you don't need it from Merck. Donuts. You don't need donuts. But you love getting them from Duncan. <laughs> Younger daughter flew into Brussels. You know, she's going to some music program over there. Um, she flew into Brussels, sent us a picture from Brussels Airport. Duncan Donuts. <laughs> First thing she does when she goes to Brussels is get donuts. I told her, oh, go to Belgium, get frites. You know, Belgium's famous for its French fries, for its beer. Um, and for its waffles. Um, generally good cuisine, um, but no, Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> oh, yeah, Hennians used to have the best donuts, but they're gone. Can't go there after class. Ah, oh, forget it. Okay. Yeah, this is how people felt after eating Hennians donuts, but it's gone. I should get rid of that. <laughs> um, okay, which is better for you? Puppies, penicillin, or donuts? Of course, if you need penicillin, you know, penicillin, donuts, no, not so much. Puppies, yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. Um, puppies may be more better for you than penicillin. I don't know. Companies want inelastic demand. Why? You know, you go to your boss and tell them, you know what, I found that the elasticity of demand for our products is close to zero. They'll pat you on the head and tell you, great, we can raise prices. On the other hand, 
they may growl at you that this means that lowering prices is not going to get any more sales. Yeah. So I say companies want an elastic demand so that they can raise their prices without an increased profits without losing sales. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to keep in mind that it means they're not going to gain any sales by lowering the prices. And you know, that they may want to increase their market anyway. But they're not going to be able to. People, inelastic demand means people are going to buy a certain amount. And that's it. If you try to make, they may try to make you think that you need their product by distinguishing their product from rivals. Why do they do that? Why do they, you know, do all this? A lot of the advertising is meant for purposes of product differentiation. Show our product's different. You know, our car is basically the same as every other car, but we're going to try to sell it as something different. Our drugs are basically the same as this, as the um, generic drug or you know almost generic drug that everybody else is selling. But we're going to try to make it sound different. Why? Because you're walling off your consumers and telling them that they can't change their product, you can't change what they buy, that's lowering the elasticity of demand. It means that when they raise prices, you're gonna stay with them. You may or may not need their product, but if you can't get anything else, oh, gas, gas companies, you know, gasoline companies do this all the time. Advertise <laughs> our gasoline will clean your engine. Oh, come on, it's all crap, it's all the same stuff. Um, but, um, the purpose is to try to persuade you that when they raise their prices, you still have to stick with it. Yeah. Some things come in elastic demand because they're the same. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Taylor Swift is unique. Um, she's the only Taylor Swift. Uh, <laughs> um, Leah Michelle is unique. Anne Hathaway is unique. Um, you know, um, these are all unique. And, you know, pretty desirable. Um, I like Anne Hathaway. I think she's a good actress and has good values. Um, Leah Michelle, eh, gather that she's a jerk. Um, but, you know, um, will you go to a movie because Anne Hathaway's in it? Or will you buy a record or whatever? Will you buy music? Do any of you buy music? <laughs> you know, whatever. Will your parents buy music um, because it comes from Taylor Swift or um, Lady Gaga? Taylor Swift tries hard to prevent people from just copying her, you know, uh, pirating her music or streaming her music. Um, but, uh, and she is one of the very few who can get away with it. People will buy, will pay for her music. Um, you're not talking about live shows, which is which have become the way that musicians support themselves. Um, okay, anyway, demand elasticity does not depend on how important things are. It depends on whether you can substitute for them. You may like Anne Hathaway, but what the hell? There are a lot of rom-com stars. I mean, her acting is fine and you know, she seems like a pleasant person, but what the hell? I'll go, uh, I'm not going to go to a movie because of her, which means that um, there are limits to how much she can raise her prices. You know, I mean, studios will pay to have her on the, you know, um, in their movies, but yeah, they're not going to pay all that much. She raises, tries to get too much, they'll just say, oh, the hell with you, we'll go to somebody else. Um, if Taylor Swift says, I'm not performing unless you give me an extra million dollars or whatever, they may say, hmm, could we substitute Leah Michelle for, for Taylor Swift? Lady Gaga? <laughs> no, no. Um, that's a tough one for them. You know, she is kind of unique. Britney Spears for Lady Gaga? No. Um, you know, Lady Gaga is in a certain niche, but yeah, she's getting old, yeah. So, um, Britney Spears has had a bit of a renaissance since her emancipation. 
Um, but still, and Leah Michelle, ah, everybody hates her. Um, two ways to reduce the last is the man. Make people think that life without the product's not worth living. You have to have this. You want to be sexy? You have to have this. Yeah, that's good. But it's more important to reduce alternative sources of supply. <gasps> Apple is really good at this. I mean, they, you know, they put out their products like you have to have it, you have to have it. Yeah, but I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of other phones and laptops, etc. But um, you know, ours is special. Um, and once you're in our world, you can't get out. Only our power cords, only our um, wireless phone uh, head, you know, uh, buds will work. You know, um, or you can harass and destroy the competition. For example, uh, many of you use Google Apps, uh, sorry, Google Maps, right? Okay. Some of you may have a few years ago used something else, Waze, W-A-Z-E. Waze was really good. And they integrated social, um, uh, uh, social media information, um, they gave you updates on road conditions, all the stuff that nowadays you're used to seeing on Google Apps. What happened to Waze? Waze was bought. Google bought Waze for either 300 or $500 million. Waze is a company in Israel. Um, Google bought them and um, integrated over a period of two years. You saw this if you were paying attention. They integrated um, the functions of Waze into Google app, uh, Maps. Um, Google Maps is better, that's good, but you don't have the Waze competition. Um, they do this all the time. You know, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, all the time, they're buying up the competition. Um, uh, Disney bought Pixar, this is a little while back. Um, they made it worse, but they bought it to cut out the competition. First, Disney tried to make its own animation studio work, and then it just wasn't going well, so they just bought Pixar um, and got rid of the competition that way. Um, uh, uh, Disney, uh, let's see, how was it? I think CBS owned um, one of the Star Trek timelines. I think CBS owned the Kevlar, Kev, the Kelvin timeline, and um, Disney owned the, uh, or C, uh, uh, Paramount owned one and CBS owned the other. Um, after a while, to eliminate the competition, CBS laid out a ton of money and bought the other timeline from Paramount eliminating competition, reducing the elasticity of demand for their products. If you want Star Trek, I mean, you, obviously you don't need Star Trek, but if you want Star Trek, you have to get it from CBS. Yeah. Um, persuade them that there are no substitutes. Buy the jeans, they're the only jeans that will work for you. If you want to be sexy and happy, you have to have our product. Yeah. What this means is you're creating scarcity. Google Maps, Google's creating scarcity in the map area. I mean, okay, come on, it's not a big deal. And I'm fine using Google for everything. Um, CBS is creating scarcity in the Star Trek world by eliminating competition. Oh, and if you try to write a Star Trek book, <laughs> you'll run it. I had a friend who did this. You'll run into a lot of troubles. Um, uh, Disney may not seem that way, but Disney creates scarcity in Star Wars by preventing other people from putting out Star Wars stuff. It may not seem that way because they're piling the Star Wars stuff out there, but okay. Um, did we really need Obi-Wan? Uh, we needed the Obi-Wan. Did we really need the Baba Fett? Uh, not at all. Um, but the point of, one of the points of capitalism is to create scarcity, to lower the elasticity of demand for your product. That's a way to increase profits. And the one way you do it is by eliminating 
competition. Um, you could try doing what Donald Trump does and kill your competition. Um, do I know that he kills people? No, I don't. So I guess I shouldn't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it's this is something that a strategy you could follow. Maybe not kill your competition, but buy them up. Buy ways. Um, by the Kelvin timeline. Um, you can do that. Drive them out of business. That's certainly a law of established techno uh, technique. Um, you, you know, accept low profits and just wait them out. Drive the price really low to drive them out of business. Um, branding, saying that this is the only thing that's, you know, um, that creates a certain scarcity. Um, restrict access to the technology. Don't let anybody else have your have access to your technology. That's been an, an Apple strategy. Uh, Microsoft didn't follow that strategy. It's, it's interesting. Um, okay, reduce access to resources. The thing is, capitalism is about profit. You know, I mean, it's like this is just the way it is. Capitalism is not about use value. Making useful stuff is a happy accident of capitalism. It's not what capitalism is about. What capitalism is about is making profit. And if you have any doubt about it, walk into your boss's office and tell them that you want to do something useful for the world and you don't care about profit and you see how long you stay on the job. It's not what companies are about. As my father once said to me, my business is not an Ellie Mossonary institution. Um, I had to look it up. It means charitable. What he, my father was saying to me is his business is about making profit. That's how capitalists survive and that's how they flourish. Um, and the best way to do it is by establishing a little monopoly with lower elasticity of demand and milk the consumer surplus. Brand name, grab resources, restrict technology, all those things. Trademarks, patents, restrictive labor contracts, land grabs, all these things. Capitalists profit when you can't get substitutes. They want to eliminate substitutes to their product, lower their assets of demand. And you see this in strategies all the time. Okay. Artificial scarcity allows capitalists to milk the consumer surplus by raising prices without having a reduction, reduced supply, reduced demand. Yeah, this, the demand curve I show here is highly elastic. Uh, you know, that preferred demand curve is highly inelastic, so you just push that price higher and higher. Um, and if that makes you unhappy, that's too bad, but it certainly will make you less happy because you're paying more for the same thing. Yeah, you, know, you wonder why aren't they happier? Yeah, down with monopoly. Okay, consumer surplus, the extra pleasure you get um, over and above the price of commodities. It tells you how much you'll reduce consumption if prices go up, and how much you will buy if prices fall. That's something to remember. I've emphasized when prices go up, but the prices fall is also important. Um, how much you need the product, but more important, more to the point, how, much, how easy it is to find substitutes. And capitalists try to turn surplus into profits by raising prices. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> okay. This was a pleasure, as always. Um, and uh, there we go. That's lecture four. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.